So it, uh, it's great to be here. It's in, really encouraging to see so many hands go up when Thomas moves the entrepreneur. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever seen that before in the Indian context. Uh, so it's really, really encouraging. The, the place where I start is it takes time. People are impatient. Uh, whenever I'm asked, well, why isn't there one? I think three years ago, uh, when I was here, I couldn't find product entrepreneurs. There were always services of one sort or another. I think two years ago, I spoke at NASCOM in uh, Bangalore, I believe. Oh, yeah. And for the first time, I saw the beginning of entrepreneurs wanting to do real product uh, companies. You have to sort of keep that in mind. And it's only accelerated fairly recently. And I'm sure, as many of you entrepreneurs know, it's hard when the economy turns, sentiment turns negative, funding slows down, so you have to slow down, you have to be reactive to that. So it takes time. Uh, when I ask the flip question, yeah, Facebook's successful, but when did it start? It's almost 10 years ago. So my bet is 10 years after you have 1,000 decent product startups, you'll see a Facebook-like entity. Uh, the, the key goal, and it's encouraging to see the motto there, 10,000 startups. Uh, the, the key thing is startups are improbable things to become multi-billion dollar companies, but they're not unimportant. And people mistake the fact that something's improbable with something unimportant. Mm -hmm. When I like to say, and this is encouraging hopefully for all of you startups, the only thing that's important is the improbable. Because everything else is business as usual and pretty boring. So I'd say enough time will cause startups to happen. An environment that encourages startups to form. I was talking to somebody uh, yes, uh, this morning who said it took him as much to incorporate as much cost to incorporate his com company here mm -hmm. as it did in California. Wow. Now that's a shame because it discourages a lot of entrepreneurs. We should make it really cheap and in inexpensive to start a company mm -hmm. and try something, especially somebody who's willing to commit their salary and go without salary, live with their parents and do their startup at the same time. I mean, that's the usual model of how the best startup started. Mm. Uh, so I think we can accelerate it, but uh, I'm generally pretty positive and optimistic. Okay. Um, Nandan, you're, you're pretty close to the Indian situation here. You know, the thing that I'm hearing often is that Indian entrepreneurs are risk averse. They're not taking as many risks. And when you talk to the entrepreneurs, they'll tell you, well, the VCs don't fund high-risk investments, so why would we uh, take up uh, high-risk uh, projects? And if you ask the VCs, they probably they point to the complex, you know, ground realities on the ground, which make funding these projects riskier. How do you, how do you sort of break this uh, Gordian knot? I mean, you worked with sort of uh, intractable problems in the past. Well, I think uh, it's really about uh, creating a critical mass in each of these things. I mean, I think if there are enough entrepreneurs, enough VCs will come. If there are enough entrepreneurs and VC, there'll be uh, liquidity events. Liquidity events will demonstrate value creation that will excite more people to come. So you know, you have to create this uh, flywheel of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And I agree with uh, you know that uh, these days I see really exciting companies. And I think uh, uh, the entrepreneurs I meet today are far more sophisticated. They're far more global. Uh, they, they're very savvy, they, you know, they, I'm very impressed. And I think that it's just a matter of time before out of these thousands of entrepreneurs, you'll get really large companies uh, coming out. You just have to hang in there and keep, keep at it. Of course, there's also a role to make sure that the environment uh, is, for entrepreneurship is good. You need to make sure that 
liquidity events, whether it's through IPOs or through acquisition. That, that whole thing needs to be probably more streamlined. But since you sort of have worked with the government, is there a role for the government to help set up something, jumpstart something, so that this thing uh, sure. I moves mean, forward? I, I mean, we we'll just, let's see how governments have uh, entrepreneurial innovation. The first is that certainly in the US, a huge amount of innovation has been funded by government. You know, if you look at the uh, funding of the DARPA, DARPA funded the internet, DARPA funded self-driving cars 50, 20 years back, DARPA, you know, and or you're the NSF funding. So there's a huge amount of funding in the US for even the mouse. We right. think of, the mouse was funded by a government grant to Xerox Park it, to Douglas Engelbert in, 19, in the 1970s. Right. So the G, uh, GPS was a government funded thing. So there's a whole role for government to fund. There's also a role for government, so that is more in terms of research kind of things. It's a little more dangerous, more risky for government to fund businesses because then who decides? I'd rather have Vinod fund a business because Vinod has the skin in the game and he'll figure out how, how to make it happen then, then have public funding in, in venture capital capital. Mm -hmm. The third thing, of course, I think is, is creating platforms. And uh, you know, internet has become a global platform. GPS has become a global platform. We, we believe that Aadhaar is going to drive a global, I mean, a national platform. So I think governments have different, and of course, there's a larger issue. Uh, governments have to make running businesses simpler, right. Right? starting a company, shutting a company, hiring people, paying taxes. So the whole, that's, like, that's just not just for entrepreneurs, but for everybody. So there are a number of uh, dimensions to this. But I think government has a huge role in, in, in enabling that. I mean, when you think about it, the IC, you know, the IC was developed in 1959. Mm -hmm by uh, you know, the Robert Noyes at Intel and uh, Texas Instrument, Jack Kirby. And the reason why the IC became such a huge product was because of the Sputnik. Because what happened, in the, the, the Russians launched the Sputnik in 1957, mm -hmm. which caused the Americans to respond by saying, we need to compete and man on the moon and all that. And the moment you went to uh, launching a, a rocket, the electronics on that had to be very small. And the only way you could do that was by having ICs. So ICs was a product which came and enabled you to launch rockets. Mm -hmm. So, so on and so forth. So I think there's a huge interplay between public Coming goal and, 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 and thing. And I think we have to recognize where governments have to take a role, mm -hmm. which is enabling infrastructure or platforms or, or long-term research funding. And where we let entrepreneurs uh, do their job. I think those countries that can get the balance right between where does government intervene and, and where government does not intervene, they are going to get it right. I, I'll take a recent example in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the US government funded a lot of solar companies, right? But a lot of them didn't do well. The real success story in the US in the last five years in energy has been shale and unconventional oil. Mm -hmm started by a guy called George Mitchell, who was a Texas wildcatter. So th that's innovation. And I think we need to create that environment. Absolutely. Um, we know one of the things that I'm sure a lot of them are asking is, how do you pick winning teams? Um, you know, is there something that you're looking for in an entrepreneur or a startup? Are there like essential ingredients that you're looking for? What is the secret? So there's no one picture of an entrepreneur. What I'd say, if there's one thing to pick, uh, it's open-mindedness. Because hmm. an entrepreneur who knows what he doesn't know is very valuable, way more valuable than somebody who assumes they know everything, or somebody who, th uh, who thinks he can do everything. So, uh, you know, my view is an entrepreneur has to be good at one or two things, really good, and know where he needs help and get other people. Uh, th the second part is the most common mistake in entrepreneurship. Because you're good at one or two things, you assume you're good at everything else. Mm. Um, and, and it turns out that there's a genetic basis for that I won't go into unless somebody has a question. Uh, you tend to minimize, entrepreneurs tend to minimize risk and have strong belief systems. Mm -hmm. And they start to believe, which uh, prevents them from questioning the things they're not good at. Uh, but I think being good at a few things, being very persistent, not giving up easily, uh, and uh, knowing what 
where they need help is very important. What I'd say is the practical answer is I have found the best entrepreneurs seek out the best people. Uh, and people often ask me why was Sun successful because we collected talent like you wouldn't believe whether we needed them or not, whether we could afford them or not. Uh, if somebody was good, we hired them. Bill Joy wasn't too expensive, was he? No, no but uh, we had to convince him to drop his PhD. <laughs> Entrepreneurs are generally good salesmen too. They sell to employees, they sell to customers, they sell to investors. You just have to be in that mode of selling all the time. But it really is, if there was one thing, it'd be recognizing great talent and knowing how to get them on board.